Welcome to the Kingsbridge is Simple and Secure podcast, where we will discuss no building threats, no people threats, no third party supplier threats, and no systems attacks. All these combine to create chaos for your business, and they will be battled by King Phoenix and his shield. Hi, welcome to the KISS BCP podcast. I'm your host, Roswita Fur. Like and subscribe to the KISS BCP podcast wherever you listen or watch. And now, on with the show. Hi, welcome back to the KISS BCP podcast. Thanks for joining us today. If you missed us last week, we are talking about business impact analysis and using that to develop your recovery strategies. So today is part two with my guest, Leona Cohen. Again, if you missed last week, go back and listen. It's a good one. If you haven't already, take a moment, please, to like and subscribe to the KISS BCP podcast. You can find us wherever you listen or watch. Thanks again. And um, we're going to dive right back in again. Thanks for joining us, Leona. Um, Last uh, episode, we talked about um, sort of alternate workarounds and reallocating resources and planning ahead before a disaster and thinking about technology RTOs um, and, and other types of, of recovery strategies that you could come up with. So I'm going to let you kick it off and um, I'm looking forward to having the rest of our conversation. Thanks again for being here. Great. Thank you for having me back. So Yes, we, we did talk about, you're right, getting, looking at the BIA, using that BIA, because that is foundational. Looking at your processes, your process RTOs, recovery time objectives, how soon does a process need to be back up and running, making sure your recovery strategies align with the process recovery time objectives, looking at the dependencies you identified in your BIA, and we talked about application dependencies, we talked about vendor dependencies. And the next one I'd like to mention is looking at, hopefully you identified, where does your staff sit who do the work? What facilities do they sit at? Where do they do the work? And that really then does tie into, oftentimes ties into your scenario of loss of facility. What if something happens to the, the facility where staff works? What are your potential recovery strategies? And a lot of times it's really going to depend on the type of work you do. For a technology company, it may be a very simple staff will turn to remote work. S simple. Okay, we can do that. There may be other types of companies where that really isn't possible. And I think about perhaps like call centers or maybe it's warehousing or something else, even hotel. Think about a hotel. It, it's, a, it's a site and you have staff that work there. So there's so many different types of industries, some that may absolutely necessitate a facility and some, yeah, we, we could flip and work remote or maybe the staff already works remote. And so that type of scenario, loss of facility maybe doesn't even apply. So it's very individual. So again, in your BIA, if you identified where does staff sit, you've identified your facilities. Now you can start thinking about what if the facility goes down? I gave the example already of a potential strategy might be go remote. Mm -hmm. Staff just logs in from home. It may be where you have developed or established a contract, and this also could flow into or be, be similar to your loss of vendor mm -hmm. scenario, where you, you have already pre-established a secondary contract so that you already have a facility to go to. You have alternate work sites. Mm -hmm. You can develop other third-party recovery 
contracts. It could be temporary spaces. Uh, some people use, for instance, well, I shouldn't throw out company names, but there are companies who lease out office space as needed. There are quite, quite a handful out there. It also depends on where you're located. You may have a contract with a hotel to use conference room space. There are many different types of strategies. Again, it's going to be very dependent on your business. Think if you worked in a hotel, maybe you have a, an agreement with another hotel to utilize some of their space or perhaps if you are a large hotel with you know different properties yeah. in different locations you then have processes or functions that are less critical less time sensitive perhaps put on hold to accommodate the most critical parts of your business so really think about not just what are our critical processes, but what are our less critical processes? Who can we send home or put on hold or perhaps borrow employees from a, a, a different department that's not so time sensitive to then put all hands on deck for this most critical process during a disaster? I think that's a really useful perspective it's common to get really sort of worked up about the most critical processes, the shortest RTOs, the most sensitive applications. But looking at the flip side of that, as you mentioned, what's not critical? Who doesn't have anything to do for the first week or two because their function isn't as time sensitive, not that it's less important, just right. less time sensitive looking at so what are those resources that you do have access to because these things are not as time sensitive and figuring out can you and how can you utilize whatever that is to support the more critical things and that ties back to something that you had said early on about the staffing but i think that's true for space as well mm -hmm. um, if you have unused space of any kind can it be repurposed um, the, the hotel contract with hotels has been very popular in the past. The providers that offer alternate work site or alternate data centers, those, of course, also. Um, cost is obviously a factor there in terms of what is the company willing to spend on a contract for uh, another you know, facility of some kind. So, yeah, great, yeah. great, great points. Right. And also... If you have multiple facilities and you have something within driving distance, even if it's a long drive, and I would also consider flying, but also you have to think about, well, flying might not be possible at time of disaster. But if you have advanced warning, let's just use hurricanes, for example, you have advanced warnings, who are you going to send to your other facility that's out of the predicted zone? Right. So really think about all your alternatives. Talk to staff, talk to one another, talk to other departments who could vacate seats at the at the other site to make room for the most critical staff and not the staff, but to do the function that the staff do, the most critical function. So I hope that sounded okay. It did, yeah. It's, <laughs> it it's always one of those things where, especially when doing the BIA, you really see sometimes people's fear and, and ego come out because they are concerned about their, their job security. If I'm not critical, if my function's not critical, can I be replaced? And it really is about things being more or less time sensitive. Mm -hmm. Companies wouldn't pay you to do a job that didn't need to be done. Exactly. Bottom line. That right? is what I so that is what I say. And and yeah. it's at time of disaster at is the other emphasis. Absolutely. That makes such a difference. And and how we present that information to the people that are helping us develop all of this information is really critical because you need their buy-in, you need their support, their willingness to work with you on a project that is not necessarily part of their job scope. 
Um, so being sensitive to people's fears can really help pave a smoother path for this for these conversations. Exactly, and and that is why identifying recovery time objective is important because everybody's job is important, but just some job functions are more in the critical path mm -hmm. and must continue at time of disaster. But then you could also utilize the whole spectrum of recovery time objectives to your advantage. Mm -hmm. And so the final point I would like to say of pulling out from your BIA, if you identified this, and if not, still think about it, is think about your internal upstream and downstream dependencies. What other departments depend on you to get your job done or who do you depend on to get their job done or you, you have a workflow? And in thinking about that, think about, well, who do I need to inform? Something's happening. Who do I need to communicate with within the company? Do I have their phone number? Do I have their email? Do I have a way to contact them? And again, it's inflows and outflows. If my inflow department is having an issue and I need to communicate with them, make sure you have the contact info. Again, what do you want at your fingertips? Mm -hmm. What do you have to not, what would you like to not have to worry about a time of disaster? Because there's gonna be plenty going on. So the more, you have available to you, the easier it is. And a whole nother topic, but I'm, I'm just gonna make a very quick point, and it's not my area of expertise, but there's a whole spool of study on crisis psychology. Oh yes. And how your brain switches. And I, I've definitely studied up some on that, but I'm not an expert, so I won't be doing a podcast on that <laughs> one. <laughs> but I find Nobody's. it very fascinating. Yes. And, and even feeling it myself and, and when I've had to deal with crises mm -hmm. and feeling that switch. So really to sum it all up is first and foremost, keep it simple. A, a, a little pro tip is verbalize it to somebody. I might, I might just tell you, Rosvita, this is what our recovery strategy is for, and again, your scenarios, loss of facilities, loss of staff, and I really didn't touch upon that. However, uh, loss of staff is really thinking about who else could facilitate or what is the most important aspect of this process? What's the minimum we need to do? Mm -hmm. I'll just say that. Loss of technology that you depend on, and if you have critical vendors, so those yeah. are your high level scenarios, taking the information that you already identified in the BIA, develop those recovery strategies. Again, verbalize it. I'll say, Roswita, our recovery strategy is do, do and then da, da. I can easily tell you, probably easier for me to tell you than write it down on a blank piece of paper. Yeah. And you might then, as I bounce it off, you ask me some questions. Well, how are you going to call that person? How are you going to contact that person? Oh, who's your alternate vendor? You could just act as mm -hmm. the sounding board. So having somebody to verbalize it with sometimes is just so much easier because you're just talking. And it helps and, keep it simple and making sure that it's, it's if you're, especially if you're telling somebody who's not in the field, making it simple enough for a non-BCP professional to understand here's the plan and then taking that sort of as a very clear picture and drafting that out into even just sort of a, a numbered list of steps um, with the information that you need about different vendors or contact phone numbers and things like that is more than what you had before you started this. And every step you take helps get you there at time of disaster, even if it's not done. Exactly, and make sure, does it make, ask yourself, to ask each other, does this make sense? And do we meet our process recovery time objectives? Great. So I would encourage while verbalizing it, record it because then you could just write down what you said. Yeah. And so really it, even though it might sound complicated when you're just 
talking through it and brainstorming, it really becomes easier mm -hmm. than it sounds. Yeah, I think it's very easy when you're new to this um, to be overwhelmed by the acronyms and concepts if they're not very sort of clearly and briefly laid out. Um, it can feel really overwhelming um, to, to start or start reading any of the sort of best practices and things like that when you're starting out. Like it's a lot to take in, but a lot of it is just common sense with mm -hmm. a specific glossary for, for what we do included. Um, but as you say, recording it, saying it out loud, and then writing it down gives a lot of clarity to what you're doing. Um, and I would just add probably a couple things for what you really want to see at time of disaster. And then I'd love to hear anything that you'd want to add on to that. Um, my, my mental thought and how I always describe this to people that I've worked with on developing everything from the BIA all the way through to a final plan is what do you want in your hand as time of disaster, as you've said? The thing is, the way that I picture this and the way that I describe this is, all right, there was a, a fire alarm in your building. It really was like not just go stand in the hallway, but an actual evacuation. And there is a real fire. You didn't, you didn't, weren't able to bring your laptop with you. All you have is your phone. What do you need on your phone at time of disaster when you are standing in a parking lot looking at the burning building? What do you need right there? to be able to activate your plan, execute your plan. That's not a hundred page word document, not ever, no. never, never, never. The four page binder on the shelf is, if it's not already gone, get rid of it. Um, I subscribe to you want 10 pages or less because that's about all you can handle in the first hours of a disaster. Yes, obviously there's supporting documentation, specific documentation for processes and the steps that need to be followed. Absolutely. But that's not your core plan. Right. So now tell me what you would add to that, if anything, or what you would do differently. No, I, I agree. And I would have, like you said, if you just, you're standing out there with your phone, have a, something very high le level. Who do you call? And then and then get their number. So your those initial first steps of when something happens, your mind does the flip, and it's your blood is racing. Yeah, have your initial first steps, and practice them. Exercise, and that's a oh, of course a whole different topic, but building that that body memory. Your body will remember what it's done before, what it's practiced as your mind, that, that uh, muscle memory is what I meant mm -hmm. to say, but your brain has that muscle memory. So talk it through, talk it through with, with the team, make sure it makes sense to everybody, run it by the newbie <laughs> or somebody who's not as familiar with what you do. Do the, the lo I call it the logic test. Does this make yeah. sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. it makes sense. Or yeah, that doesn't really make sense. Let's switch it out. So logic test, practice, and you've got a good start. You're all you're always going to during a, an incident, there of course will always be things that, gosh, I didn't see that coming, or things right. that you just didn't expect. You can't plan for every detail and you don't want to. Like you said, 10 pages or less, you have the backbone. You yeah. have your guiding light, and that is what you want. And all your decisions will be based around that foundation. And I'm using this as if it's a spine, but mm -hmm. it really becomes the core yes. of the decisions you will make during an incident. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I've really enjoyed talking with you and enjoyed talking about this particular topic. I think it's very valuable and I think people can get hung up on the BIA process and the recovery strategy process. And oh goodness, let's not even talk about RPOs right now, recovery point objectives, um, because 
you get hung up on that stuff and it's easy to do even when you have you know years of experience it can be very easy to get hung up in details are important but but you can't let that stop the progress right any anything you can do today to add information or detail or research for what your next step is in your building your bcp plan wherever you're at in that any of that is better than what you had yesterday exactly Um, it's it's you know i really encourage and i'm I'm going back to sort of the, the theme that we have of you know it's the beginning of the year get your plan done um here it is february all right not done that's okay let's at least get started but if you look exactly. at it as sort of this whole thing it's really overwhelming to think about all the work that goes into it because it's months in some cases years to do all this work but if you say okay this week or this month i'm going to do these three things i'm going to research alternate vendors i'm going to build this particular list of information, whatever that is, is more than what you had yesterday. And if your disaster happens tomorrow, you're one step closer to hopefully having a successful recovery. So I really encourage everybody who's watching and listening to don't put off getting started because it seems overwhelming, just like any other big project, break it down into small steps and you can start and feel successful and gain momentum to do more and more as time goes by. So thank right. you, Leona, for joining us today. Thank, thank you so much. And I really would like to emphasize, because I was thinking the same thing, um, is you will fill in the details over time. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't build a house overnight. Get your foundation, your BIA, get your framework, and you will continue to develop it over time and refine it. So thank you again, Rosita. It's it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us today on the KISS BCP podcast. Um, We will publish a new episode every two weeks. We hope you enjoyed today. Check out uh, the last episode where we did part one with Leona Cohen talking about your business impact analysis and developing your recovery strategies strategies from that document. Thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.